I've looked at a few moon landing hoax videos in the past and the arguments are always the same. However, what if they weren't? What if instead of talking about the LEM or the spacesuits, they decided to have a go at the Saturn V rocket? Let's find out. <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Four Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a quick thank you to the sponsors of today's video, Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter, Monday to Saturday, that gets you up to speed with all the business news within five minutes. Before I subscribed to Morning Brew, my mornings were running around the kitchen with a coffee in hand, dodging the kids and the cats. Now, I take five minutes to sit down with my coffee and Morning Brew to catch up on the latest, business and tech news. And what's great is that it's all witty relevant news, a world away from the normal dry, dense, boring news sites. And what I find especially good is the sheer variety of news on offer. And there's even a little game to play as well to test your knowledge on the daily news. There's absolutely no reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew if you're interested in business, tech or finance. It's completely free and takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Click on the link in the description to subscribe to Morning Brew today. Right, back to today's video where Randy Walsh has a real problem with the Saturn V rocket, one in which he believes is the primary reason we didn't go to the moon. Let's find out with this one, shall we? What Randy's got to say. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about the Saturn V rocket and the lack of testing that was done by NASA. But first, I want to show everyone this uh, collage that my nephew's wife Michelle made for me. So let me get it a little closer. She did an excellent job and um, I really like it and uh, I cherish it so thank you Michelle. I believe this is a collage of his book that he released, which you won't be surprised to hear, is a book about the moon landing and how he believes it's a hoax. Okay, anyway, back to the Saturn V. Today I'm going to be talking specifically about Apollos 4, 6, 8, 9, 10 and 11. Okay, fair enough, but I'm not really sure why you've stopped at 11. There were not really any significant changes to the Saturn V rocket between Apollo 11 and 12. Now, Apollo 4 was the first um, test of an all-up Saturn V. So that's an all-up test. So that included all the parts that had never been tested together before was done with Apollo 4. Now, this was an all-man launch. This mission apparently went perfectly, according to NASA. Apollo 4 was, of course, the first time that the Saturn V rocket was used, as Randy said. It was essentially testing the first two stages, and the mission lasted nine hours, achieving everything that it set out to do. The second um, unmanned test of the Saturn V was with Apollo 6. This mission was plagued with problems that NASA does admit to. Now, NASA says the problem with Apollo 6 was pogo oscillations. And because of the pogo oscillations, the engines in the second stage, the J2 engines, um, were disrupted. So they had multiple failures. I believe they had two failures. Actually, one failure, and then the computer, for some reason, shut down the second engine. And NASA said this was caused, caused by disruption in the fuel lines brought on by pogo oscillations. Now, what pogo oscillations is, is instability along the longitudinal axis of the Saturn V. Apollo 6 did have problems, yes, but the oscillating you described, or pogo effect, did not affect the rocket structurally. They would have just been a real problem for any crew that would have been riding in the cockpit. Apollo 6 also had problems later on in the flight when it came to stage 2 and 3 burn. Now NASA did try and compensate for this, but the desired re-entry didn't end up happening. This, NASA says, caused the problems. I certainly don't think the oscillations themselves caused a problem. They were a symptom of the problem in itself. The oscillations occurred when a partial vacuum in the fuel and oxidizer feed lines reached the engine firing chamber causing the engine to skip and happened exclusively in the final 10 seconds of the stage one burn. But when you look at this a little further, you notice that NASA never says anything about the F1 engines. It never says that they were disrupted by any fuel lines breaking 
NASA literally say on their website that the problem did occur in the engine. So I don't really know what you are talking about here. But interesting enough, it did affect the uh, second stage engines and the third stage engine. So when you look further at this, you find out that actually it most likely was the F1 engines. And in fact, it was the F1 engines, not most likely. It actually was a problem with the F1 engines. Indeed, like they said. Now, to explain, the F1 engines are needed for an Apollo moon landing. And the reason being is the F1 engines were um, supposed to be the most powerful engine, rocket engine, ever produced. Yes, they were, and I believe they remain so. Each engine would produce a thrust of 1.5 million pounds. There were five of these engines in the first stage of the Saturn V for a total of 7.5 million pounds. I'm sure he's got a point about these engines. Without 7.5 million pounds, you cannot launch an Apollo payload into low Earth orbit for an eventual uh, trip to the moon. So therefore you have no Apollo landings. If the F1 engine is not working perfectly, you have no Apollo moon landings. You don't say, Sherlock. Is that genuinely your reason for the moon landings not happening? Now, the problem that NASA does admit to, actually, that they have constant problems with uh, the F1 engines, is the area of the combustion chamber. NASA says that there was instability in the combustion chamber. Now, just to briefly explain uh, a description of what I'm talking about here, when you look at a rocket, we all see the nozzle of the rocket engine on the bottom. On top of the nozzle is an area called the throat. On top of that is the combustion chamber. Now, and of course, on top of the combustion chamber, you have the rest of the engine that uh, mixes the propellant and then sends it through to the, uh, to the combustion chamber for a controlled explosion. He clearly believes that the F1 engine exists and works, so I don't know what his problem is. That controlled explosion is pushed through the throat and then out through the nozzle, which propels the rocket up. So NASA had to find a way, though, to cool the temperatures of the combustion chamber, which could reach up to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So they came out with a method called the regenerative cooling system. Now this is, uh, was used in liquid-fueled rockets, which the F1 engine was. Now what that is, is, is hundreds of small tubes that run outside of the combustion chamber, the throat area, and partway down the nozzle. And propellant would be pushed through these hundreds of thin, very thin tubes and the propellant would absorb the thermal energy produced by the controlled explosion within the combustion chamber. Ingenious, isn't it? So far, he seems to be marvelling at the technology. I wonder when his eureka moment is going to come. And then that propellant would be directed into the combustion chamber, which is supposed to have made for a more fuel efficient or more efficient engine. However, there's where the instability is the tubes were breaking down. And because they were breaking down, they were not absorbing enough thermal energy to keep those temperatures down. So it was creating instability within the combustion chamber. So in order to overcome that, NASA had to um, find a way, in other words, the only way they could do it was to use the F1 engines at um, lesser thrust. So if they were using less thrust, they weren't producing the power necessary, which defeats the whole purpose of using the F1 engines in the first place. This is where we start to get a little bit shaky. I couldn't find any information regarding the pullback of thrust for the F1 engines at any point. And the cooling system was very complicated, even having the potential to weaken after multiple uses. However, the F1 engines were only used once on each trip. This is apparent when you analyze Apollo 6. It was burning kerosene, which is very interesting, because the F1 engines were the only engines in the Saturn V rocket that actually used kerosene, along with liquid oxygen. Now, NASA says that they solved all these problems in just seven months leading up to the next launch of a Saturn V 
Apollo 8. They actually did, and it involved pumping pressurized helium through the liquid oxygen fuel lines. This allowed the liquid oxygen some space and when pushed through the injector plate was not at such high pressure. This solved the instability problem. Now here's where it gets interesting. Apollo 8 was the third launch of the Saturn V, but it was also the first manned mission of a Saturn V. So they sent the first manned mission of a Saturn V with only two all-man test of the Saturn V and its F1 engines. That is a total of 19 hours for the Saturn V rocket and a total of 4 minutes for the F1 engines. The F1 engines had been tested extensively though before Apollo 6. They knew that these engines worked. Look to aviation. You try to do something like that in aviation, you would be laughed out of the room. There wasn't a major time-dependent goal that an entire planet was waiting on in aviation though, was there? And this doesn't mean that the moon landings didn't happen. If you want to say it wasn't 100% safe, fine. If you want to say it was careless, okay. But that does not mean that they didn't go. In aviation, even with today's sophisticated technology, and uh, by comparison to 50 years ago, and software uh, techniques that are used to design these aircraft, you still, they still do hundreds of hours of testing on the engines of these aircraft and on the airframes of these aircraft before these planes are certified for commercial use. But these aircraft will be used by millions of people on repeated journeys. There is a difference here. But not so with NASA. NASA said that with only two unmanned launches of the Saturn V, for a total of 19 hours uh, and, for, uh, and, and a total of four minutes for the F-1 engines, in which one of these unmanned launches, Apollo 6, was plagued with problems, that they solved all those problems in just seven months without any further testing the actual conditions of flight to send the first manned mission on Apollo 8. And NASA claims that it worked perfectly. Now, I might add that Apollo 8 was not only the first manned mission of the Saturn V, it was the first manned mission to leave low Earth orbit and circumnavigate the moon, according to NASA. Oh, here we go. Apollo 8 didn't happen either, apparently. Now, you can factor in Apollos 9 and 10 leading up to Apollo 11 and say, well, there was two more rocket launches. but when you total up the total time of these F1 engines, they had about 10 minutes of uh, flight testing total before Apollo 11. Okay, but they're only used for a very short time duration each use. Again, this doesn't mean they didn't go. No way. Absolutely no way. And this is for me one of the biggest indicators that these missions were faked. I think by the very nature of how it all happened, you simply have to believe that it's true. If NASA wanted to fake the moon landing, surely they would have just told you all that they tested the engines extensively, so much so that there was no issue at all or no safety problems. Why not send up a few more rockets for testing just to seal the deal? They weren't there to appease the conspiracy theorists or the general public. They were there to put humans on the moon as quickly as possible, and they did that. You have a total, up to Apollo 11, you have a total of the F1 engines um, with 10 minutes of flight in actual conditions. Unbelievable. Just, there's just no way. What is it with personal incredulity being a good enough reason to doubt something? Crazy. And there's no way they could have solved the problems with the Apollo 6 in just seven months leading up to Apollo 8. Why not? Seven months is a long time when you have the majority of your agency working on it probably 24-7. Let alone Apollo 11. So anyway, I'm going to be talking more about this in future videos because I do want to get into more detail. I do talk about this extensively in my book. So I hope you check that out. No thanks. I'm sure it's more of no way and unbelievable. This has been very, very poor. Even as moon landing conspiracies go, it was terrible. Should we give Randy one more chance? Let me know in the comments and we'll maybe do another video.
Right, there we go. Another Tim Ford Tuesday all wrapped up nicely. Thank you very, very much for watching. I do hope you enjoyed it. Just enough time to once again thank Morning Brew for sponsoring today's video. Remember, click on the link in the description and you can subscribe to Morning Brew today. I really do genuinely hope you enjoyed the video today. If you did, then please, please do drop a like on it and subscribe as well. I have been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a great week and I'll see you all on Friday for some more Flat Earth fun and the return of DITRH. See you then.